Chapter Twenty One of The Stolen Singer by Martha Fletcher Bellinger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Twenty One Jimmy Redivivus. If the occupants of the old red house felt overmuch inclined to draw a long breath and rest on their oars after their anxiety and recent excitement, Agatha's manager was able to supply a powerful antidote he was restlessness incarnate he was combining a belated summer holiday with what he considered to be good business seeing not only his prima donna secluded at ilium but other important people all the way from portland to halifax when he heard that the man who ran off with his racing car was also responsible for the mysterious departure of miss redmond his excitement was great you mean to say that you were picked up and drugged in broad daylight in new york he demanded of agatha practically that and you escaped the yacht foundered and that scamp walked right into your hands and you let him go agatha forced a rueful smile i confess i'm not much used to catching criminals mr straker paused lacking words to express his outraged spirit i don't mean you of course this whole outfit here what are they doing think they're put on in a walking party eh? don't they know enough to go in out of the rain getting no reply to his fuming he came down from his high horse curiosity impelling what did he kidnap you for ransom no it seems that he mistook me for miss rainier the lady out there on the lawn talking with mr van camp mr straker bent his intent gaze out of the window i don't see any resemblance at all his crusty manner implied that agatha or somebody was to blame for all the coil of trouble and should be made to pay for it even i was puzzled smiled agatha i thought she was someone i knew nonsense growled mr straker anybody with two eyes could see the difference she's older and heavier what did the scoundrel want with her i don't know she's a princess or something mr straker jumped she is he cried lord why didn't you tell me i'm trying to advertisement he shouted joyfully jiminy christmas we'll make it up all this time lost princess who where from i guess you do look like her after all i see it all now headline strange confusion of identity which is the princess it'll draw crowds thousands agatha escaped leaving mr straker to collect from the others the details of his advertising story which he did with surprising speed and accuracy by the next morning he had pumped sally dr thayer and aleck van camp and had extracted the promise of an interview from miss rainier herself the only really unsatisfactory subject of investigation was mr hand whom straker watched for a day or two with growing suspicion straker had sputtered good-naturedly enough over the accident to his racing car and had taken it for granted in rather a high-handed manner that mr hand was to make repairs his manner toward the chauffeur was not pleasant being a combination of the patron and the bully it was exactly the sort of manner to precipitate civil war though diplomacy might serve to cover the breach for a time but the racing car ignominiously towed home by miss rainier's white machine stood undisturbed in one of the open carriage sheds by the church eluded by hand for the space of twenty-four hours and finding that the injury to the car was far beyond his own mechanical skill to repair mr straker sent peremptory word to charlesport and to the hillside for the services of a mechanician without satisfaction little simon thought the matter was beyond him but informed mr straker that perhaps the engineer at the quarry a native who had been to boston and qualified as chauffeur would come and look at it then for heaven's sake colonel get him to come and be quick about it adjured mr straker and tell him for me that there's a long yellow for him if he'll make the thing right he'll charge you two dollars an hour including time on the road solemnly announced little simon 
unimpressed by any mention of the long yellow had little simon liked he could probably have mended the car himself but mr straker's manner so effective on broadway was not to the taste of these country people he thought of them in their poverty as peasants but without the kindliness of the born gentleman what aleck van camp could have got for love mr straker could not buy and he was at last obliged to appeal to hand through agatha's agency i look at it again hand replied shortly when agatha addressed him on the subject the car being temporarily out of commission it was necessary for mr straker to adopt some other means of making himself and everybody about him extremely busy he took a fancy for yachting and got himself diligently instructed in an art which of all arts must be absorbed with the mother's milk taken with the three r's and followed with enthusiastic devotion in mr straker every qualification for seamanship was lacking save enthusiasm but as he himself never discovered this fact his amour proper did not suffer and his companions were partly relieved of the burden of his entertainment presently he made up his mind that it was time for him to see jimmy his nose trained for scenting news led him inevitably to the chief actor in the unusual drama which had indirectly involved his own fortunes and he saw no reason why he should not follow it at once you'd better wait a while cautioned dr thayer that young man pumped his heart dry as a seed pod and got some fever germs on top of that he isn't fit to stand the third degree just yet i'm not going to give him any third degree not a bit of it hero saved a princess and all that that's what's coming to him as soon as the newspapers get hold of it but i want to know how he did it and what he did it for tell him to buck up jimmy did buck up though mr straker's message still remains to be delivered he gathered his forces and exhibited such recuperative abilities as to astonish the old red house and all ilion dr thayer and each of his nurses in turn unconsciously assumed credit for the good work and sally kingsbury took a good share of pride in his satisfactory recovery two eggs regular she would say with all a housekeeper's glory in her guest's enjoyment of food there was enough credit to go round indeed and jimmy presently became the animated and interesting centre of the family he might have been a new baby and his bedroom the sacred nursery he was being spoiled every hour of the day did he have a good night agatha would anxiously inquire of mr hand can't tell which is night he sleeps all the time would be the tenor of mr hand's reply or sally would ask as if her fate depended on the answer did he eat that nice piece of chicken aunt susan and mrs stoddard would say eat it it disappeared so quick i thought he choked wanted three more just like it but i told him that invalids were like puppy dogs could only have one meal a day well how did he take that asked the interested sally he said if i thought he was an invalid any longer i had another guest coming says he'll be up and into his clothes by tomorrow and is going to take care of me says i'm pale and need a highball whatever that is never heard of it said sally he's a good young man if he did get pitched overboard went on mrs stoddard but he doesn't need me any more and i guess i'll be going along home i don't know but what the rest of us need you complained sally it's more of a sunday-school picnic here than you'd think what with a new york press agent and a princess to say nothing of that mr hand he certainly knows how to manage a sick man said susan he don't talk like a christian said sally mrs stoddard made her way to agatha in the cool chamber at the head of the stairs agatha in a dressing sack with her hair down called her in and sent lizzie away you're not going are you mrs stoddard she took susan's two hands and held them lovingly against her cheek it won't seem right here without you you've done your duty agatha and i've done mine as i saw it i'm not needed here any more but i'll send angie over to help sally with the work after i get the crab apples picked agatha held mrs stoddard's hands closely 
ah you have been good to us there is none good but one quoted mrs stoddard nevertheless her eyes were moist with feeling you'll stay on in the old red house i don't know probably not for long but i almost wish i could i've learned a sight by you agatha i want you to know that said susan struggling with her reticence and her impulse toward confession oh don't say that to me mrs stoddard i can only remember how good you've been to us all but susan would not be denied i thought you were proud and vain and and worldly agatha and i treated you harsh i know no no whatever you thought it's all past now and you are my friend you'll help me to take care of this dear old place yes the lord will establish the work of your hands my child she suddenly turned with one of her practical ideas i wouldn't let that new city man in to see mr hamilton just yet if i were you is mr straker trying to get in to see mr hamilton knocked at the door twice this morning and i told him he couldn't come in why not said he danger of fever said i then mr hamilton asked me who was there and i said i don't exactly know but it's either miss redmond's maid's beau or a press agent and then mr hamilton called out as quick and strong as anybody go away i think i've got smallpox and he went off quicker in a wink and hasn't been back since mrs stoddard's grim old face wrinkled in a humorous smile i guess he'll get over his smallpox scare but mr hamilton don't want to see him not yet he wants to see you i'm going in to see him soon anyway said agatha but still she waited a little before going in for her morning visit with james it meant so much to her it wasn't going to be taken lightly and casually but with a little pomp and ceremony each day since the night of the crisis she had paid her morning call and each day she had seen new lights in jimmy's eyes in vain had she been matter-of-fact and practical treating him as an invalid whose vagaries should be indulged even though they were of no importance he would not accept her on those terms back of his weakness had been a strength more and more perceptible each day touching her with the sweetest flattery woman ever receives it was the strength of a lover's spirit looking out at her from his eyes and speaking to her in every inflection of his voice moreover while he stoutly and continuously denied his fever sickness he took no trouble to conceal this other malady as soon as he could speak distinctly he proclaimed his spiritual madness though nobody but agatha and possibly mrs stoddard quite understood i'm not sick don't be an idiot hand and give me a shave for heaven's sake anybody can get knocked on the head that's all the matter with me give me some clothes and you'll see even hand had to give in quickly jemmy's resilience passed all expectations he came up like a rubber ball and now on a fine september morning he was getting shaved and clothed in one of aleck's suits finally he was propped up in an easy chair by a window overlooking the towering elm tree in the white church mm, andy couldn't you get me some kind of a tie the soft shirt business doesn't look very fit does it without a tie coaxed jim if you ask me i say you look fine where'd you get all your good clothes i'd like to know inquired jim sternly looking at hans immaculate linen mrs sally washes em after i go to bed in the morning confessed hans oh she does does she jeered jimmy well you'll have to go to bed at night like other folks now and then what'll you do i guess miss sally'll have to sit up nights modestly suggested hans when a slipper struck him in the back good shot what do you want now an opera hat he inquired derisively and ejaculated jim dismay settling on his features i've just thought do you suppose i'm paying hotel bills all this time at the la rue hand grinned unsympathetically if you engaged a room sir and didn't give it up i believe it's the custom that'll do for now handy andy if you can't get up any better answer than that lord what's that jim suddenly exclaimed as if he hadn't been waiting all ears for that very step in the passage 
i guess likely that'll be miss redmond replied the respectful hand and so it was agatha fresh as the morning stood in the doorway for a contemplative moment before coming forward to take jim's outstretched hand samson shorn she exclaimed gaily i hardly know you all fixed up like this oh i look much better than this when i'm really dressed up you know jim asserted agatha patted his knuckles indulgently looked at the thinness and whiteness of the hand and shook her head not gaining enough yet she said that isn't the right color for a hand it needs to be held longer oh no it needs more quiet fewer visitors no talking and plenty of fresh milk and eggs jimmy almost stamped his foot down with eggs he cried and milk too i'm going to institute a mutiny excuse me i know i'm visiting and ought to be polite but no more invalid's food for me handy andy and i are going to out to kill a moose and eat it eh hey, andy but hand was gone agatha sat down in a big rocker at the other window in that case she said demurely we'll all have to be thinking of lynn and new york and work jim shamelessly turned feather oh no he cried i'm very ill i'm not able to go to lynn besides my time isn't up yet this is my vacation he looked up smiling into agatha's face ingenuous as a boy of seven do you always take such such venturesome holidays she asked i never took any before at least not what i call holidays he said if you don't come over here and sit near me i shall get up and go over to you and andy says i'm very wobbly on my legs and might by accident drop into your lap agatha pushed her chair over toward james and before she could sit down he had drawn it still closer to his own the doctor says my hand has to be held he assured her as he got firm hold of hers for shame she cried mustn't tell fibs tell me he begged is this your house really and truly it brought as he knew it would her ready smile yep she nodded and is that your tree out there yep ah he sighed it's great it's paradise i've dreamed of just such a heavenly place and andy says we've been here two weeks yes and a little more my holiday half gone his mood suddenly changed from its jocund and boyish manner and he turned earnestly toward agatha i don't know dear girl all that has happened since that night with you on the water hand shuts me off most villainously but i know it's heaven being here with aleck and everyone so good to me and you you've come back somehow like a reality from my dreams i watch for you you're all i think of whether i'm awake or asleep agatha earnestly regarded his frank face with its laughing true eyes jimmy she said he had begged her to call him that it seems as if i too had known you a long time more than these little two weeks it is more you said so put in jim yes a little more and if it hadn't been for you i shouldn't be here or anywhere i often think of that you see he cried i had to have you even if i followed you halfway round the globe even if i had to jump into the sea kismet you can't escape me but agatha was only half smiling no she protested it is not that i owe jimmy put his fingers on her lips tut tut dear girl you owe nothing except to your own courage and good swimming but as for me why you know i'm yours james agatha could not help preaching a bit just because we happen to be the actors in an adventure is no reason no real reason why we should be silly about each other we don't have to end the story that way oh don't we we'll see shouted jim and i'm not silly if some other people are i don't see why i should be cheated out of a perfectly good climax if you put it that way any more than the next fellow agatha dearest but she wouldn't listen to him no no she protested slowly but earnestly 
look here mr james hamilton of lynn i promise to do anything or everything that you honestly want after you get well i'll listen to you then but i'm not going to let a man who is just out of a delirium make love to me but i'm not just out i only had a whack on the head and that's nothing i'm strong as an ox i'm saner than anybody do listen to me agatha no no i mustn't but tell me dear you're free you're not he searched for the word that suited his mood you're not plighted she smiled no i'm not plighted ah he chortled and seized both her hands putting them to his lips she stood over him looking down tenderly time for your broth mr hambleton and mr strig wants to know if he can see you interrupted mr hunt can't see him andy i'm very busy began jim then added by the way who is mr straker tell him he may come in for a few minutes mr hunt directed agatha presently the manager was being introduced in the properest manner to the invalid agatha knowing james would need protection from quizzing stayed by now tell me wheedled mr straker the whole story just exactly as it happened to you please it's very important that i should know all the details so jimmy aided now and then by agatha delivered a strakerized version of the wreck and the arrival at ilion but before that questioned the manager how did you happen to be on the jean d'arc for the first time james hesitated not even agatha knew that part of the story i was picked up by the jean d'arc in new york harbor he replied slowly mr straker frowned how picked up out of the water what were you in the water for i had just dropped off a tug what for because i wanted the yacht to pick me up at this point mr straker directed a commiserating look at agatha it said crazy as plain as words what were you on the tug for i had followed the yacht what for the pause before james's next answer was apparent when it came there came with it that same seven-year-old look of smiling ingenuousness i just wanted to see what they were going to do with miss redmond jiminy christmas exploded mr straker any more kinks in the story how'd you know they'd stolen miss redmond and so jimmy had to tell it all with the abominable straker growing more and more excited every minute and agatha standing mute and awestruck looking at him it was plain that jimmy for the moment had the upper hand and that's about all he laughed what on earth man is the matter with you fumed straker didn't you know there were a hundred chances to one the yacht wouldn't pick you up jimmy nodded unabashed one chance is good enough for me nothing can kill me this trip i tell you i'm good for anything lucky stars over me i knew it all the time straker turned a disgusted face toward agatha he's crazy as a loon isn't he he questioned glumly but jimmy knew his man no not crazy mr straker only a touch of sun and it's glorious isn't it miss redmond she loved him for his boyish laughter for the rollicking spirit in his voice but her eyes suddenly filled as she pondered the meaning back of his extraordinary story with mr straker gone at last it was she who came to jim with outstretched hands you mean you heard me call for help there on the hill yep he answered suddenly sheepish and you followed to rescue me if you could yep of course ah james why did you do it jim's small boy expression beamed from his eyes i followed the voice and the face as i told you once before don't you remember i remember but why his seven-year-old mood was suddenly touched with poetic dignity i could not else he said looking into her face it was all tenderness and she did not resist when he drew her gently down till her lips touched his End of chapter twenty one
Chapter Twenty Two of The Stolen Singer by Martha Fletcher Bellinger. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Ferrard. Chapter Twenty Two A Man of No Principle. Monsieur Chatelard's disappearance was as complete as though he had dropped off the earth. The sheriff, with his warrant in his pocket, hid his chagrin behind the sugar and flour barrels whose sale occupied his time when he wasn't losing malefactors chamberlain having once freed his mind to the grave-like hand maintained absolute silence on the subject so far as the audience at the old red house was concerned but he went into consultation with aleck and together they laid a network of police inspection about ilion and charlesport it won't do any good grumbled chamberlain will have to catch him and choke him with our own hands if it ever gets done nevertheless they left nothing to chance telegraph and telephone were brought into requisition and within twenty-four hours after the disappearance every station on the railroad as well as every village along the coast was warned to arrest the fugitive if he came that way mr chamberlain took the white motor and went off on long mysterious journeys coming back only to go into secret conclave with aleck or mysteriously to rush off again aleck van camp stayed at home keeping a dog watch on melanie and madame reynier whether they were at the hillside or at the old red house now that the purposes of the frenchman had been made clear and since he was still at large the world was no safe place for unattended women aleck pondered deeply over the situation is your amiable cousin's henchman a man to be scared off by our recent little encounter do you think he asked of melanie she considered he might be scared easily enough but i know well that he has a contempt for the usual machinery of the law he has evaded it so many times that he thinks it an easy matter aleck smiled whimsically i don't wonder at that if he has had many experiences like the last he boasts that he can bribe anybody ah so but how much rope would the duke give him do you think on a pinch all the rope he cares to take stephen's protection is all-powerful in crovets and elsewhere chatelard depends as i have said on his wits but there must be some limit to the duke's stretch of conscience melanie's eyes took on their far-away look perhaps there is she said at last but who can guess where that limit is besides all he asks of his henchmen is results he never inquires as to methods well what do you think is the exact result duke stephen wants in this case he wants me either to return to crowlets and marry his brother or melanie's hesitation was prolonged or what or to disappear so completely that there will be no question of my return you see it's a peculiar case if i marry without his consent which you are about to do cut in aleck i simply forfeit my estates and they go into the public treasury where they will be strictly accounted for but if i marry lorenzo which is impossible then the money goes into the family of course as my dot or or if i should die in that case stephen inherits the money and there is no doubt but that stephen needs money aleck pondered for several minutes while grave shadows threatened his face but presently his smiling unquenchable good temper came to the surface and he gleefully tucked melanie's hand under his arm as i said before you need a husband very badly oh i don't know she laughed the result of aleck's moment of grave thought came a few days later with the arrival of two quietly dressed unostentatious men he told melanie that one man was a chauffeur for the white machine and the other was an extra hand he had engaged for the return trip on the seagull the chauffeur however for one reason or another rarely took the wheel and could have been seen walking at a distance behind melanie whenever she stirred abroad the extra hand for the seagull 
did just the same as the chauffeur from the day of the arrival of the manager mr hans rather mysterious but friendly temper underwent a change for the worse he not only continued silent which might easily be counted a virtue but he became almost sulky which could only be called a crime there was no bantering with sally in the kitchen scarcely a friendly smile for agatha herself mr hand was markedly out of sorts on the morning following mr straker's request that hand should repair the car the manager found him tinkering in the carriage shed near the church the car was jacked up on a horse block while one wheel lay near the road mr hand was as grimy and oily as the law allows working over the machinery with a sort of vicious earnestness mr straker hovered around for a few moments then addressed hand in that tone of pseudo geniality that marks a certain type of politician look here colonel i understand you were in the employ of that french anarchist it was an unlucky moment for attack though mr straker did not at once perceive it hand carefully wiped the oil from a neat ring of metal slid down on his back under the car and screwed on a nut as mr straker hands in pockets and feet wide apart watched the mechanician there came through the silence and the sweet air the sound of thrushes calling from the wood beyond mr straker craned his head to look out at the church then at the low stone wall as if he expected to see the songsters performing on a stage before a row of footlights he turned back to mr hand that's right is it you work for the slippery monsieur um hand grumbled with a screw in his mouth something like that what'd you do i found where she was wrenched in the turnover and got to have a new pen for this off wheel before she goes much farther all right i'll order one by telegraph to-day what did you do i asked hand wriggled himself out from under the car and got on his feet he thrust his grimy hands deep into his pockets stood for a moment contemplative and belligerent as if undecided whether to explode or not and then silently walked away as mr straker watched his figure moving slowly toward the kitchen he started a long low whistle expressive of suspicion and doubt midway however he changed to a lively tune whose title was i've got him on the run a classic just then spreading up and down broadway he took a few turns about the car looking at the gearing with a knowing air and then went into the house if he had been a small boy his mother would have punished him for stamping through the halls being a grown man and a visitor he may be described as walking with firm bold tread finally he was able to run down agatha who was conferring with sally in the library sally sniffed in scorn of mr straker whom she disliked far worse than mr hand nevertheless as she left the room she twisted up her gingham apron and tucked it into its band in a vague attempt at company manners mr straker lost no time in attacking agatha what you know about that chauffeur nurse and general roustabout that's taking care of your young gentleman upstairs he inquired bluntly innocent of subtlety as mr straker was he was nevertheless keen enough to see that agatha's instincts took alarm at his words indeed one skilled in reading her face could have detected the nature of the uneasiness written there she could not lie again as she had unhesitatingly lied to the sheriff neither could she abandon her position as protector to mr hunt she wished for cleverness of the sort that could throw her manager off the scent but saw no way other than the direct way nothing i know almost nothing about him comes from new york i fancy so well take it from me the sooner you get rid of him the better chances are he's a man of no principle and he'll do you agatha was silent meantime mr straker got a second wind of course he knows what he's about when it comes to a machine the manager continued but mark me he knows too much for an honest man looks to me as if there wasn't anything on this green earth he can't do green ocean too he's quite as much at home there laughed agatha hm. 
mr straker grunted in disgust let me assure you miss redmond that it's no joking matter tradition to the contrary agatha was content to let the man have the last word mr straker turned to some business matters wrote out telegraphic material enough to occupy the leisurely charlesport operator for some hours and then disappeared agatha was impressed by the manager's words somewhat more than her manner implied she had no swift and sure judgment of people and her experience of the world short as it was had taught her that recklessness is a costly luxury she was meditating as to the wisest course to pursue when the ex-chauffeur appeared hand wore his accustomed loose shirt and trousers without coat or waistcoat and it seemed as if he had never known a hat his thick hair was tumbled back from the forehead his hands were now spotless and his whole appearance agreeably clean and wholesome he even looked as if he were going to be frank but agatha knew that must be a delusion it was impossible however not to be somewhat conjoled he was so eminently likable agatha took a lesson from his own book and waited in silence for him to speak mademoiselle his voice had an undertone of excitement or nervousness that was wholly new well mr hand he remained standing by the door for a moment then stepped forward with the abrupt manner of a stripling who usually inarticulate has suddenly found tongue why did you do it mademoiselle do what my friend back me up before the sheriff and give me a slick walk out like that agatha laughed good-humouredly <laughs> why should i answer your questions mr hand when you so persistently ignore mine hand made a gesture of impatience mademoiselle you may think me all kinds of a scamp but i am not idiot enough to hide behind a woman don't you know me well enough to know that he demanded so earnestly that he seemed very cross agatha looked into his face with a new curiosity he was very young after all something in the way of experience had been grinding philosophy of a sort into him or out of him wealth and position had been his natural enemies and he had somehow been led to an attitude of antagonism that was at the bottom quite foreign to his nature so much agatha could guess at and for the rest instinct taught her to be kind but she was not willing now to take him quite so seriously as he seemed to be taking himself she couldn't resist teasing him a bit by saying nevertheless mr hand you did hide behind me you had to he did not reply to her bantering smile but in the pause that followed stepped to the bookcase where she had been standing gingerly picked up a soft bit of linen and lace from the floor and dropped it into her lap then he faced her in an attitude of pugnacious irritation for a brief moment his silence fell from him i didn't have to he contradicted i let it go because i thought you were a good sport and you wouldn't catch me backing out of your game not by a good deal but there's a darn sight pardon me mademoiselle there's too much company round here to suit me you know me you know you can trust me mademoiselle but what about tom dick and harry all over this place casting eyes at a man agatha almost against her will was forced to meet his seriousness half way i don't know what you mean she said tell him he burst out tell him the whole story tell that blamed snoopy manager that i'm a crook and a kidnapper and then he'll stop nosing round after me i'll have an hour's start and that's all i want dogging a man running him down under his own automobile hand permitted himself a dry smile at his own joke but immediately added it goes against the grain mademoiselle agatha's face brightened as she grasped the clue to hans wrath i've no doubt she answered gravely she knew the manager but why should i tell him as you suggest why hand stopped a moment as if baffled at the difficulty of putting such obvious philosophy into words why because that's the way people are never satisfied till they uncover and root up every blamed thing in a man's life yes mademoiselle you know it's true they'll always be uneasy with me around 
agatha was aware that when a man utters what he considers to be a general truth it is useless to enter the field of argument suppose you do have an hour's start as you express it where would you go oh i'll look about for a while after that i'm going to mr hambleton and lynn he's going to have a new car ah uh -huh. agatha suddenly saw light then there's only one thing mr hambleton must know the truth it can concern no one else will you tell him mr hand produced his dry smile nobody has to tell mr hambleton anything he looked straight into my face that day on the hill as we were leaving the park and he remembers something strange in hans expression arrested agatha's attention long before he found tongue to answer it was a look of happiness and pride as if he owned a treasure he remembers it very well mademoiselle and what you can't help but be square with him mademoiselle but as for these gentlemen of style hand paused in his oratory his slow anger again burning on the surface before agatha knew what he was about he had picked up the handkerchief from her lap between thumb and forefinger and was holding it at arm's length you can't squeeze a man's history out of him as you squeeze water out of a handkerchief mademoiselle he flared out and you can't drop him and pick him up again nor throw him down you can't do that with a man mademoiselle he tossed the flimsy linen back into her lap and i don't want any dealings with your strakers nor gentlemen of that stamp nor chatelards he's slick slick as they make em but he isn't an inquisitive meddler agatha laughed outright and somehow by the blessed alchemy of amusement the air was cleared and mr hand's trouble faded out of importance but agatha could not let him go without one further word she met his gaze with a straightforward look and as she asked tell me have i failed to treat you as a friend mr hand ah mademoiselle he cried and there was a touch of shame and compunction in his voice as he stood before agatha she was reminded of his shamed and cowed appearance in the cove on the day of the rescue when he had waited for her anger to fall on him she saw that he had gained something some intangible bit of manliness and dignity won during these weeks of service in her house and she guessed rightly that it was due to the man whom he had so ungrudgingly cared i'm glad you are going to lynn to be with mr hambleton she said at last and as long as he is your friend i shall be your friend too and never uneasy you may count on that and now will you do me another kindness i'll put that old racing car in order if that's what you mean of course as soon as possible but it would seem that from now on you are accountable to no one but mr hambleton i'm his man said mr hand simply i'd do anything for him he turned away with his old-time puzzling manner half deferential half indifferent and so mr straker was ready to depart for new york at last leaving agatha much against his will to complete her recovery at ilium at least that was the way he felt in duty bound to put it you have found a substitute now agatha urged it is only fair to let her have a chance a week more or less cannot make any difference now that i've broken so many engagements already i'll come back later and make a fresh start you stay up here in new york forget your living growled mr straker not if you continue to be my manager said agatha if i'm to be your manager i ought never to let you out of my sight for a minute it's too dangerous End of chapter 22chapter twenty three of the stolen singer by martha fletcher bellinger this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt chapter twenty three jimmy muffs the ball it will sometimes happen that young gentlemen skipping confident even under their lucky star will get a fall fortune had been too constant to jimmy not to be ready to turn her fickle face away the moment he wasn't looking but such is the rashness born of success and abounding heart 
that young blood leaps to its doom smiling as it were on the faithless lady's back jimmy had no forebodings but rioted gorgeously in returning health in a whole pack of new emotions and in what he supposed to be his lady's favor aleck more philosophical took his happiness with a more quiet gusto not provoking the frown of the gods but for jim the day of reckoning was coming one day aleck joined him walking up and down the porch jim was in one of his boyish cocksure moods i know what you're going to say he began before aleck could spring his news you're going to marry the princess just so said aleck how'd you know clairvoyance nope well you needn't look so high and mighty about it old man why don't you do the same thing yourself then we'll have a double wedding i've thought of that said jim as the two men talked agatha and melanie both dressed in white strolled side by side down the garden path toward the wall they were deep in conversation their backs turned toward the veranda i don't see that they look so much alike announced jim who had but recently learned all the causes and effects of the chatelard business aleck's eyes gleamed which one as they stand there now do you take to be miss redmond he asked one on the left answered jim promptly aleck gave a signaling whistle which caused both the women quickly to turn agatha was on the right aleck grinned broadly so that yahoo of a frenchman wasn't so stupid after all i'd like to get my hands on him muttered jim frenchman or not there's going to be a wedding right here in the old red house on wednesday said aleck hoopla i knew that was it and then melanie and i are going to cruise back to new york awfully sorry but you're not invited you couldn't get me aboard any gilt-edged yacht that floats at jimmy's words wholly untrue by the way aleck's happy mood suddenly dimmed as he thought of the dangers and anxieties of the past month he turned and laid an arm boy fashion over jim's shoulder pulling his hair as his hand went by you're a fool of a kid he said choking when jim looked into his cousin's face he knew oh i say old man it wasn't so bad as all that aleck stiffened up who said anything about its being bad you'd better get some togs to wear at the wedding i'm going to need these clothes myself it turned out actually enough that the wedding was to come off on a certain wednesday in september would you like new york and a bishop and a big church better than the old red house and the charlesport minister aleck anxiously asked of melanie oh no she protested and aleck knew she was sincere so they prepared to terminate their holidays by celebrating the wedding in the pine grove melanie spent the intervening days happily with agatha or walking with aleck or with the delightful group that foregathered in parson thayer's library jimmy made extravagant and highly colored verses to to the bride-to-be to sally kingsbury and even to himself his feet were often lame but he solemnly assured the company that it was entirely due to circumstances over which he had no control a wedding was a wedding said he and should have its bard also its dancers and its minstrels we'll have all our friends in ilion anyway said aleck they counted up the list besides the occupants of the house and those from the hillside there would be dr thayer susan stoddard and angie big and little simon and the lawyer and they're all going to dance with the bride announced jim after me i'm first choice the dance led so to speak by the elusive monsieur chatelard the name alone made jimmy wroth it's a dance for which he will pay the fiddler yet he prophesied oh he's gone this time scared out of the country for keeps was aleck's expressed opinion but that it might or might not be so was what they all secretly thought the day before the wedding was a jewel of a day such as new england at her best can fling into the lap of early autumn a wind from the sea flocks of white clouds scudding across the sapphire sky and a sun all kindness such was the day it was never a weather breeder either 
but steady promising good for the morrow many times during the week james and chamberlain and agatha had their heads together planning surprises for the bridal pair the result was that on tuesday jim and chamberlain borrowed the white motor-car loaded it down with a large variety of junk such as food from sally's kitchen flowers and so on and started for charlesport they ran down to the wharf transferred their loot to the rowboat and pulled out to the seagull swinging at her mooring in deep water a half hour of work and the yacht was dressed for festival there were strings of flags to stretch from bow to masthead and to stern pennants for topmasts the stars and stripes in beautiful silk for a standard and a gorgeous banner with an embroidered a and m intertwined for special occasions flowers were placed in the cabins and food in the lockers the seamen had been aboard made the yacht clean and shipshape as a war vessel on parade and had got permission to leave for their last night ashore everything was in readiness even to the laying of the fire in the engine hold the bride and groom were to come aboard the next day about noon and cruise down the coast leisurely as weather permitted hand in charge of the white motor-car with madame Rainier, chamberlain agatha and jimmy were to start for new york touring as long as their inclination lasted the sophisticated lizzie was to travel to what was for her the centre of the universe by the fastest pullman jimmy and chamberlain on the way home from their visit to the seagull came very near being confidential i want to say mr hamilton that i shall never forgive myself for bungling about that chatelard business as i understand the matter it wasn't your bungling but the sheriff's it's all the same conceded mr chamberlain mournfully and in my opinion the frenchman's not done with his tricks yet he's a dangerous character mr hamilton jim laughed remembering certain incidents on the jean d'arc do you know chamberlain continued i'm convinced the bloomin beggar is hiding about here somewhere i'm glad aleck is getting away i thought the evidence favoured the theory that chatelard had made straight for new york not a bit of aleck and i let you all believe that for the sake of the ladies but the evidence is all the other way we would surely have caught him if he had been on any of the new york trains i believe he's about here and means mischief yet if he's about here there's no doubt about the mischief i'm going down to-night to bunk on the seagull aleck let the men off to go to a sailor's dance over on one of the islands they'll probably be at it all night so i'm going back why not let me go i'm fit as a fiddle you've had your full share of nasty detective work not at all i'm booked to see this thing through all right laughed jimsy but if you change your mind let me know arriving at the house the men found it deserted windows were open and doors unlatched but no one not even danny responded to jim's call chamberlain started for the hillside in the car and jim wandered about lonesomely wandering where everybody was with jim as in most cases everybody meant one person and presently sally appearing slowly from the upper regions gave him his clue he started nimbly for the pine wood the wagon road stretched alluringly into the sun-flecked shade of the grove a hush like that of primeval day threw its uncanny influence over the world jim felt something tugging at his spirit that was unfamiliar disquieting he began to whistle just for company and in a moment as if at a signal call danny came along the path sedately trotting to meet him hello old partner so this is where you are danny said yes and led jim into the clearing and up to a pine stump where everybody sat quite alone chin propped on hand no singing no book or did jimmy imagine it a spirit decidedly quenched her eyelids were red and her face was pale so dear lady i have found you but i was listening for the song there is no song to-day agatha's manner resembled an arctic breeze may one ask why one cannot always be seen no why not i could if i could 
agatha was obliged to relax a trifle at jimmy's foolishness but only to reveal more and more distinctly a wretchedness of spirit that was quite baffling it was not feminine wretchedness waiting for a masculine comforter either as james observed with regret it was a stoical spirit braced to meet a blow or to deal one jimmy was not used to being snubbed and instinctively prepared for vigorous protest he began with a little preliminary diplomacy you haven't inquired what i'm going to do with the remainder of my holiday he remarked i supposed you would return soon to lynn shall we walk back to the house the unkind words were spoken in a rare sweet voice courteously enough jim looked at the speaker a moment then emphatically said no it is quite time i was returning have you anything there to do that is more important than listening to me for fifteen minutes agatha did not pretend not to understand him she turned toward him with unflinching eyes truth to say yes mr hambleton i have i don't wish to listen to anything oh if you feel like that your mr hambleton is enough to strike me dumb believe me it is the best way again may one ask why you are going back to your own people to your own work and i to mine but that's the very point my idea was to to combine them i guessed it jimmy smiled his ingenuous smile as he suavely asked and don't you um, like the idea agatha turned her wretched white face toward him into it there had come a grim determination that left jimmy quite out in the cold i have no choice in liking or disliking it she said quite evenly but there are plenty of reasons why i can't think of it and you shouldn't think of it any more i assure you you are making a mistake she got up as if ready to walk away her face averted agatha at the name she turned to jim as much as to say she would be quite reasonable if he would be but her face suddenly flushed gloriously agatha dear hear me i did not intend to tell you all my secret to-day not until i should be on neutral ground so to speak but i can't let you leave me this way you will have to i am going back to the house up to this point james had merely been playing tag as it were the game wasn't really on a little skirmishing on either side was in order but agatha's last words were the call to action they roused the ghost of some old hamilton ancestor who meant not to be beaten jim squared himself in the middle of the path touched agatha's shoulder with the lightest most respectful finger and requested but i would ask you as a special favor to stay a few minutes longer jim's tone left agatha no choice she sat down again on the pine stump but she could not meet jimmy's eyes he stood a few feet away from her when he spoke his voice was firm and steady ringing with earnestness there was no doubt now but that he was in the game for all he was worth agatha you shall not turn me down like this wait until you know me better and know yourself better you've had no time to think this matter over and it involves a good deal i admit but we have lived through a good deal together in these few weeks i am here i am here to stay you can't say now dear that you care nothing for me can you what is the use of all this i ask you will always be my friend my rescuer to whom i am eternally grateful jimmy emitted a sound halfway between shucks and damn and swung impatiently clean round on his heels grateful to be hanged i don't want anybody to be grateful i want you to love me to marry me why agatha he argued boyishly his hopes rising as he saw her face soften a little you're mine for i plucked you out of the sea i had to have you i guess i knew it that sunday only it was way off somewhere in the back of my brain you're a dream i've always loved just as this old house is you're the woman i could have prayed for i'll do i'll be anything you wish i'll change myself over but oh don't say you won't have me agatha agatha you don't know how much you mean to me before the speech was finished 
james according to the good old fashion was down on his knees before his lady and had imprisoned one of her hands stoic she was not to yield her eyes had a suspicious moistness as she shook her head you will always be the most gallant unselfish friend i have ever known but but what marry you i cannot why not i cannot marry anybody then jimsy said a disgraceful thing you kiss me once will you do it again at this impudence she neither got angry nor changed her mind a bad sign for jimmy she put his hand away saying you must forgive me the kiss jimmy jumped to his feet with another inarticulate sound every whit as bad as an oath and stood before her agatha redmond will you marry me no jim turned in his tracks and left the wood two hours later at supper jim was inquired for our last supper together and mr hamilton not here mourned chamberlain agatha felt guilty but could scarcely confess it you are all invited for next year you know she said and we're all coming announced melanie but poor mr hamilton will miss his supper to-night the poor mr hamilton struck agatha i think mr hamilton is doing very well indeed i saw him start off for a walk this afternoon jim's a chump give him a cold potato jeered aleck but after supper was over and the twilight deepened into darkness agatha sought aleck where she could speak with him alone i i think mr hamilton was troubled when he left here this afternoon she said can you think where he would be likely to go he is not strong enough to bear much hard exercise yet aleck looked at her keenly if he went to anywhere i think he'd go straight to the yacht i feel a little anxious some way confessed agatha chamberlain's voice broke in upon them anybody ready to take me down to the seagull in the cob as aleck started for the machine the anxiety in agatha's face perceptibly lightened and may i go with you she asked eagerly End of chapter 23chapter twenty four of the stolen singer by martha fletcher bellinger this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt ferrard chapter twenty four after you monsieur jim had no desire to create a sensation among his friends at the old red house but as he left the pine grove all his instincts led him to flee in another direction he did not fully realize just what had happened to him but he was conscious of having received a very hard jolt indeed the house full of happy associations as it was was just now too tantalizing a place aleck had won out and he and melanie were radiating that peculiar kind of lover's joy which shines on the eve of matrimony jim wished them well none better but he also wished they wouldn't make such a fuss over these things get it done and out of the way and the less said about it the better in fact jim's buoyant and sunny spirit went into eclipse he lost his holiday ardor and trudged over the hill and into the shore road in a state of extreme dejection but he lingered on the way diverted almost against his will by the sight of fishing smacks putting in to harbor an island steamer rounding a distant cliff and the seagull lying motionless just within the breakwater women may be unkind but a ship is a ship after all one cannot nurse the pain even of a shattered heart when running before a stiff wind with the spinnaker set and an open sea ahead the thought decided him the sea should be his bride jim did not stop to arrange at the moment just how this should be brought about but his determination was none the less firm he became sentimental to the extent of reflecting vaguely that this was but philosophic justice the sea had not conquered him far from it neither should she conquer him he would follow the sea the path of glamour the home of the winged foot and the vanishing sail the road to alien and mysterious lands 
thus jimmy in reaction from the arctic douche to which his emotional self had been suggested he was figuratively speaking blue with the cold but trying valiantly to warm himself as he gazed at the seagull asleep on the flood tide cutting a gallant figure in the glowing sunset he felt an overmastering longing to be aboard he would stay on the yacht until chamberlain came at least possibly all night having made up his mind on this point james persuaded himself that he felt better philosophy is a friend in need after all why should one failure in getting one's desires crush the spirit he would make a right about face travel for a year on a sailing vessel see the world that was it hang the shoe business immersed in mental chaos such as these fragments of thought suggest jim did not perceive that he was being overtaken until a slow greeting came to his ears good evening friend it was the deliberate wide-eyed youth of the reading room ah good evening if you are on your way to the sailor's reading room i wish to inform you that i have been obliged to lock up for to-night on account of an urgent errand at the village jimmy stared vacantly for a moment at the pale washed-out countenance of his interlocutor i thought i'd tell you the youth went on in his copy-book style so as to save your taking the long walk i am the librarian of the reading-room ah thank you but i wasn't going to the reading-room to-night i am on my way to the village well there's a large majority of people do go to the reading-room first and last the youth explained with pride and some of them are not worthy of its privileges i am on my way now to prevent what may be a frightful accident to one who has enjoyed the benefits of our work jim gazed at the youth a frightful accident then why in heaven's name don't you hurry the youth exhibited a slightly injured air but did not hasten i was just about to continue on my way he said when it occurred to me that you might be interested to know that's good of you but what is it all about some time ago a very profane and impatient gentleman waiting for money to be telegraphed to him from new york well man go on where is he i know nothing about the movements of this ungodly person but it appears that to-day for the first time in its history the quarry up yonder has been robbed circumstances led the manager to suspect that this same gentleman was the perpetrator of the theft and i am on my way to further the ends of justice no need to be so particular about calling him a gentleman but what is the accident likely to be it is feared that the thief may not be aware of the nature of the article he has stolen and it is very dangerous what on earth is it it is a fairly large-sized stick of dynamite the youth might have been discussing a fancy dance so suave and polite was he jim interrupted rudely dynamite is it good if it's old chatelard he ought to blow up serve him right i'm surprised and pained at your words my dear friend no soul is utterly yes it is which way did he go where is he i don't know the manager sent me to inform the sheriff it won't do any good but you'd better go all the same the judge in chancery went on his dignified way he would not have hurried if he had heard angel gabriel's trump the news he had brought was in the class to be considered important if true but there was nothing in it to alter jimmy's plans he took the shortest cut to the shore found a flat bottom punt that was regarded by the village as general property and pushed off the seagull was a tidy craft and looked very gay with even the half of her festival flags on view but the gaiety did not beguile jim's dampened spirits he went aboard feeling that he'd like to rip the idiotic things down but the yacht at least offered a place where he could think the sunset light on the water blazed vermilion just the color that jim all at once discovered he hated he looked down the companionway but finally he decided to stretch out on deck for a few minutes rest he was very tired off in the stern was a vague mass which proved to be a few yards of canvas carefully tented on the floor 
some gimcrack belonging to the ship's ornamentation had been freshly gilded and left to dry protected by an old sailcloth this weighed down by a rusty marlin spike spread couchwise along the taffrail and offered to jim just the bed he longed for he lay down face to the sky and gave himself up to thoughts that were very dark indeed he had been thrown down unexpectedly and quite hard and that was all there was to it agatha lovely but inexplicable maid was not for him she had been deceptive yes that was the word and he had been a fool that was the plain truth he might as well face it at once he had been idiot enough to think he might win the girl just because they had been tossed together in mid-ocean and she had clung to him the world wasn't an ocean it was a spiritual stock exchange where he who would win must bid very high indeed for the prizes of life and he had so little to bid communing thus with his unhappiness jim utterly lost the sense of time the shameless vermilion sunset went into second morning and thence to nun's gray before the figure on the sailcloth moved then through senses only half awake jim heard a light sound like a scratch scratch on the hull of the yacht chamberlain no doubt just rubbing the nose of his tender against the seagull jim was in no hurry to see chamberlain and remained where he was the englishman would heave in sight soon enough but though jim waited several minutes with half an eye cocked on the stairway nobody appeared the wind was still the sea like glass not a sound anywhere struck by something of strangeness in the uncanny silence jim sat up and called ahoy chamberlain there was no answer but in the tense stillness there was a sound and it came from below the sound of a man's stealthy tread jim sprang to his feet and made the companionway at a bound he listened an instant to make sure that he heard true cleared the steps and landed in the darkness of the ship's saloon as he groped along reaching for the door of the principal cabin the blackness suddenly lighted a little and a dim shadow shot out and up the stairway jim's physical senses were scarcely cognizant of the soft quick passing but his thumbs pricked he dashed after the shadow up the stairs out on deck and aft there he was chatelard armed facing his enemy once more cool but not smiling desperately at bay below him riding just under the stern of the yacht was the tender whose scratch scratch had awakened jim a man oars in hand was holding the boat close to the seagull jim saw all this during the seconds between his turning at the stair top and his throwing himself plump against the figure by the railing he was quick enough to pass the range of the weapon whose shot rang out in the clear air but he was not quick enough to get under the man's guard chatelard was ready for him holding his weapon high as he pressed forward jim felt something under his foot he ducked quickly as if to dodge chatelard's hand and on the downward swing he picked up the rusty marlin spike it was a weapon of might indeed jim's blow caused chatelard's arm to drop limp and nerveless but in gaining his enemy's weapon jim was forced to drop his own he put a firm foot upon the spike however while he held chatelard at arm's length and looked into his face so we meet once more after all he cried and once more i have the pistol even as jim spoke his adversary made a spring that almost enabled him to seize the weapon again jim eluded his clutch and quick as thought threw the gun overboard it struck far out on the smooth water it was a sorry thing to do as it proved for chatelard watching his chance stooped wrenched the spike from under jim's foot and once more stood defiantly at bay and at this point he opened his thin lips for one remark you go to hell now you pig of an american but after you monsieur jim cried and with the words his arms were about the other in a paralyzing grip had jim been as strong as when the two men measured forces weeks before in the forecastle of the jean d'arc the result might have been different but the struggle was too long and jim's strength insufficient chatelard freed himself from his antagonist sufficiently to wield the spike 
somewhere about jim's head and there came over him a sickening consciousness that he was going down he dropped hanging like a bulldog to chatelard's knees but he knew he had lost the game he gathered himself momentarily determined to get on his feet once more and had almost done it when sounds of approaching voices mingled with the scuffle of their feet and their quick breathing before jim could see what new thing was happening chatelard had turned for one alert instant over the port side whence the invading voices came he was cut off from the stairway caught in the stern of the yacht his weapon gone he gave a quick call in a low voice to the boat below stepped over the taffrail and then leapt overboard propped up on an elbow dazed and half blinded blood flowing down his cheek jim stretched forward dizzily as if to follow his disappearing enemy he heard the splash of the water and saw the rowboat move out from under the stern but he saw no more he thought it must have grown very dark blessed if he didn't jump overboard hanging on to that marlin spike said jim stupidly to himself and then it became quite dark when jimsy regained sight and consciousness which happened not more than three minutes after he lost them he found himself supported affectionately against somebody's shoulder and a voice the voice of all voices he most loved was in his ears here i am dear do not die i have come come to stay if you want me james dearest and bending over him was a face the very vision of his dream look at me speak to me james dear the voice was a bit hysterical but the face was eloquent loving adoring it was too good to be true though jim was disposed to let the illusion prolong itself as far as possible he put up his hand and smoothed her face gently in gratitude at seeing it kind once more then he smiled foolishly it's great isn't it he remarked inanely before thinking it necessary to remove his head her face was still the face of tenderness full of yearning it did not change she took a handkerchief from her pocket and carefully pressed it to his cheek and chin when she took it away he saw that it was red lord what a mess i'm making he exclaimed trying at last to sit up as he did so it all came back to him the flying shadow the gun this struggle he leaned over to peer again through the crossed wires of the deck railing down into the water he turned back with an amazed expression did he jump overboard honest true hanging on to that spike neither alec nor agatha could say nor yet mr chamberlain who had been searching the yacht wherever it was the rusty marlin spike had disappeared the rowboat too had gone into the darkness jim got up dazedly thinking for a moment that it was necessary for him to give up chase but he quickly sat down on the sailcloth again overcome with faintness and a dark pall before his eyes you are not hurt badly the voice was still tender and it was all for him as jim heard it the pall lifted and his buoyant spirit came back to its own he laughed ringingly lord no not hurt but but what what did you wish to say is it true are you here by me to stay for answer she pressed his hand to her lips aleck and chamberlain once assured that jim was safe went below to make a search and jim and agatha were left together on the sailcloth as they sat there a young moon shone out delicately in the west and dropped quickly down after the lost sun it's the first moon we've seen together said jim but we've watched the dawn ah yes and such a dawn little by little as they sat together the story of the fight came out jim told it bit by bit not eager when it was done agatha was still puzzled why should he come here what could he do here i don't know though we shall probably find out soon enough but i don't care now that you are here james dear will you forgive me for this afternoon i'll forgive you if you'll take it all back hide hoofs and horns wherever and ever amen i take it back i never meant it then may one ask why oh james i don't know why anybody could have told them that it was only a phase of feminine panic in the face of the unknown 
necessary as sneezing but as jim said it didn't matter never mind only i don't want you to marry me because you found me here all bluggy and pitied me james to talk like that you know it wasn't then what was it jim suddenly grown serpent-like in craft turned his well-known ingenuous and innocent expression upon her the moment you left me up there in the pine grove i knew i couldn't do without you how did you know because yes because jim prompted her oh jimsy you know no i don't agatha loving his teasing but too deeply moved too generous and sincere to play the coquette turned to him again a face shining with tenderness her eyes like stars her lips all sweetness only love james dear something rose again in jimmy's soft heart choking him as he had thrilled to the unknown ecstasy in agatha's song many days before so now he thrilled to her voice and face eloquent for him alone love and its power life and its meaning the long long thoughts of youth and hope and desire these held him in thrall agatha was in his arms time was lost to him and earth End of chapter twenty four epilogue to the stolen singer by martha fletcher ballinger this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Gerard. epilogue no one ever knew whether the accomplished frenchman reached shore ultimately in the rowboat or descended to sabrina beneath the waves if that last hasty exit from the deck of the seagull was also his final exit from life certain it is that his departure into the realm of shades was unwept and unsung the stick of dynamite was found after a gingerly search lying on one of the berths in the large cabin where it had been dropped by the frenchman in his flight jimmy hamilton did not let the shoe business entirely go to destruction though his taste for holidays grew markedly after he brought his bride home with him to lynn one year when the babies were growing up he ordered a trim little yacht to be built and put into her berth at charlesport she was named the seagull jimmy's chauffeur called hand was her captain sometimes when james and agatha were alone in the zone of stillness that hung over the listening water there would rise a song clear and bird-like free of my pain free of my burden of sorrow at last i shall see thee and again jemmy's heart would rise buoyant free happy the heart of unquenchable youth End of epilogue End of The Stolen Singer by Martha Fletcher Bellinger